<clears throat> Welcome back. I uh, have been given seven minutes uh, to introduce the topics, etc. However, uh, as a chairperson, I'm a minimalist, uh, and generally a minimalist. So what I'm going to do is not take up that time. I'll wrap up in two minutes and ask the speakers to speak. Um, <clears throat> the aim being that at the wrap-up time, maybe I'll take five minutes. Um, when I say I'm a minimalist, I am, in the sense that if you're given 20 minutes, as you roll down to 19 and a half, I start to get uh, very agitated um, and things. Um, and also, uh, during the question hour, uh, we'll have questions first, comments later, and so forth. So with that, I uh, will ask uh, the first speaker, which is um, Professor Dibyesh Anand, a very good friend, professor at uh, the University of Min uh, Westminster, to speak on the Indian perspective on the Simla Convention. Professor Anand. Thank you. So my time starts now, right? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> uh, can you even remind it's me? <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Siddiq, for introducing me, and thank you to TPI for inviting me here. I mean, I will not spend more time thanking all the distinguished guests because we don't have that much time to uh, cover all the ideas I want to cover here. Now, in terms of microphone, it's fine, right? You can hear me at the back. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Now, I mean, in certain sense, I will be talking of Indian perspectives on Shimla Agreement, but it's more about the British and Indian both. Because what is Indian is essentially what was British. In certain sense, by the end of the argument, sorry, by the end of the paper, I'd be arguing that Indian foreign policy, when it comes to Tibet, has never been properly decolonized. India is essentially following into the footsteps of Britain with all its flaws. And second argument I'd be making is that Tibet issue is, of course, as many of you are already aware, but very integral integrally connected to the border dispute and the border issue. So I'll be talking about those, both of those things. Now, we hear from different people, specifically in India and also Tibetans, uh, that you know, India and China have great uh, historical connection. And Indian claim is that the boundary is something ancient and traditional. Interestingly, between 1947 and 1951, when you look at whatever limited documents that exist in national archives that you'd get access to, or more of the documents that from Indian government that lies in Britain, when you look at those documents, you'll find that they do not, India does not use the language of traditional ancient boundary in its dispute with Tibet. So India adopts a language of traditional boundary only in dispute <coughs> with China later, after 51, not in dispute with uh, Tibet. And of course, as someone pointed out, in 48, 49, 51, for, uh, 50, there was a disagreement vis-a-vis -vis Tibet over the boundary. Now, the reason for that is because India was very much aware that the boundary that it was claiming was not traditional, but a product of Shimla Agreement of 1913-14, or Shimla Convention. So India was very much aware of the arbitrariness of it, and therefore the importance of Shimla at that point in time. Of course, later, India denies that to great extent, but not fully. So including, for instance, in 1961, Government of India, M MEA, it comes up with a statement saying, McMahon had clearly referred to the limits of Tibet in a comprehensive and general manner, and not merely to Sino-Tibetan boundary. <coughs> and said that since Ivan Chen, the Chinese pl plenipotentiary, raised no objection to the proposal, it meant that he agreed to a discussion of the Indo-Tibetan boundary by the British and Tibetan representatives. In, 1960, in 1992, there, there's a particular Indian military report, by military historian report on the 1962 war, which is partly based on Henderson Brooks' report, which, as you know, is already leaked now. So when you look at, at Henderson Brooks' report, as well as this official history, you find, again, statements such as, uh, it, it, which argue that Tibet was a sovereign, independent country, in fact, in 1940, and therefore it did give us the territory. So you can see clearly that even Indian government in its own document from time to time does mention independent sovereign Tibet of 1940. Now of course, in today India would usually not talk of independent sovereign Tibet. 
So my interest is how India has used the identity of Tibet, independent identity of Tibet, when it has suited its interest and then given up when it didn't suit its interest, right? Now, and in that sense, I would agree with them in earlier speakers, not all earlier speakers, to be honest, but some earlier speakers that what India needs is more honesty and consistency in its approach when it comes to Tibet and the importance of Shimla. Because without Shimla, there is no boundary that can be have, have any legal basis. It is very clear. Now, uh, so then now this comes from a paper which would be published, I guess, you know, by TPI and others later, and it's part of the, my book on India-China border dispute. Now the ideas break on <coughs> largely the area we are talking of. I am now talking of the what became called, called NEFA later is largely a lot of it was Tibetan territory. And in 1914, during Shimla uh, discussions, it was acknowledged that it's Tibetan. There's no, there was no doubt about it. So, for instance, Charles Bell, on 22nd November 1913, wrote that there is no strong case for areas around Thawang, and the best way would be for us to show that. I'm quoting him, Lonchen. The front, we, best way for us would be to show Lonchen Shatra the frontier we want, ask him to agree to it, and hear what he has to say about it, and then deny what he says is his statement. So the idea was, let us ask for what we need and persuade him to give it to us. Why? Because of sake of friendship. So the idea is friendship. Now, of course, 1914, there was a rupture on the on, on, in de jure in terms of uh, the documentation, but not on the ground. As we know that until 1940, including until 1950 and 51, many in Thawang did not know that they belonged to India. They did not know until 1951. And the Indian government document about 1951 calls it occupation of Thawa. Right? So they, no, they didn't use the word liberation, thankfully, but they did honestly write occupation of Thawa. So I say these things to remind us again of the importance of Shimla. Now, going back to Shimla agreement, I mean, my interest is not the entire convention, legal, non-legal, everything, but what happened on 24th and 25th of March. 24th and 25th of March is the agreement between Tibetans and the British over boundary and the trade deal. Now, again, most speakers have covered, and I think Tenzin will partly cover, so I don't want to preempt what he'll say. And all, all I can say is that, look, that agreement of 24th, 25th March is very clear. It was a secret agreement. So all this notion that, I mean, it was a secret agreement, very clearly. And it was a lopsided secret agreement and one-sided. One-sided in favor of Britain. So that particular agreement, the boundary one, it gave, for instance, the Tawang territory, and it drew Mac what became McMahon line later, without Tibetans getting anything in return. Now it's very rare in a non-colonial setup for a, an independent country to give territory without anything in return. But they didn't get anything in return in writing. Now my interest there was that, of course, remember, in terms of inter inter the, during the deliberation, the British were undecided where to draw the line, especially in the Thawang tract. One argument was draw it around Sela, so leave Thawang to Tibet. The other was take Sona in also. And the third was draw the line which they drew in the end, right? So that to give a neat boundary. So again, there was a lot of disagreement there, and there was very much clear awareness that it's a Tibetan territory that we are taking. Now, the idea is, why would Tibetans agree to it at that point in time? And as someone al already pointed out, the idea was that they expected help of Britain in negotiation with Chinese over the inner and outer Tibet. But that was not the only thing. And in that sense, I mean, let me, now, I go through, so in my paper, I go through it, and I want to read out certain comments uh, through the letters of Charles Bell, Henry McMahon, and Lonchin's own reaction to it. Like, why would they sign it? <coughs> so from very beginning, it becomes very clear that the Tibetans did not know that they're going to have to sign an agreement on the boundary. They came knowing that they're going to sign, have a treaty with China under the guardianship of Britain over something else. They had no clue that they expected to sign an agreement with India, uh, with British India. Now, when Lonchen was shown the new map, and actually Charles Bell showed the new map out of blue in January 1914, Lonchen did express anxiety. He said, look, we are not prepared. I don't know what to do. And 
what should we do? And Charles Bell said that, look, it's best to avoid raising difficulties later. And Bell's statement is, the relations between the British government and Tibet were friendly, and that it was desirable in the interest of continued friendship that a clear boundary should be arranged and friction thereby avoided. Very clearly, friendship is used in order to pressurize and even bully. And I use the word bully deliberately. Now, again, again, you can see Lonchen Shata trying to avoid signing something. Then saying, we didn't have time, we don't know. No, we have had no survey. And the British would say, no, you have to sign. If you want friendship, you have to sign. So I'll go through that, and I'll not go into detail here. But British claimed to be honest broker, which they weren't, because they were getting what they wanted to on the promised friendship. Now, Lonchen Shatra at one point in time said, OK, in the letter we will say, in the light of offer of friendship by Britain, we have agreed to give these territories. And Charles Bell says, don't write in the light of offer of friendship, because then the Chinese will accuse us of not being honest. So please don't put anything about friendship. Now see what it does. It does basically, it, it promises friendship, but gives nothing in writing. And that's what Tibetans faced there. Now, even, yes, and then Bell also conveyed to Shatra an assurance to the effect, not in writing, to the effect that the Tibetan government might, might rely on the diplomatic support of His Majesty's government and on reasonable assistance, assistance in supplying ammunition of war. Might, very good British English, might, again. Now, and this friendship was crucial for how, I mean, we have to understand this <coughs> promise of friendship in explaining why Tibetans gave up large parts of territory. Closer on 24th of March. Uh, now, in, in, until 24th and 25th, for instance, Shatra was very uncomfortable signing the memorandum. Now, the Dalai Lama, 13 Dalai Lama others had given him approval, but at very short notice, right? Because they had no option. They realized that if we don't sign, then the British would not be friendly, and then which would have a problem with vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, this Charles Bell statement. The Lonchin tried, as usual, to shuffle out of a clear acceptance, saying that the Tibetan government had sent mounted officers to the eastern part of the boundary. They don't know what to do. But I have made it very clear to them, and I'm paraphrasing him, make it very clear to them that we cannot accept anything except a clear boundary agreement. Now, towards the end, it is, and this Lonchen was reluctant to sign on the grounds of the shakiness of his handwriting, this statement from uh, Charles Will's letter, and said eventually that he would sign in the morning when his hand was steadier, but then later signed that evening. Now, why would his hand be shaky and everything? You can imagine because Tibetans did feel bullied. It's not in that they, they did feel bullied very clearly, but they made, they were thinking they were making a sacrifice for something bigger. And that bigger, of course, as we know, never came. So when Tibet was in trouble with the China, the British and the Indians who inherited the British policy never actually did anything to help Tibetans. So in that sense, that's why I wanted to highlight these aspects. But anyway, go into detail uh, a lot. I don't have that much time. Uh, so the, another agreement they signed was the trade one, <coughs> right? You know, in 1904, the, the agreement signed after 1904. In that, Tibetans had equal rights to British subjects in terms of trade without duty. This agreement actually removed that clause, and Tibetans would have had to pay duty while the British subjects in Tibet would not have to pay duty. Now, even the trade agreement was backfired for Tibetans. Why? Because when Tibetans want to modernize, and they wanted to modernize under 13 Dalai Lama, they could not tax more because the big monasteries would not allow for taxation, because the best lands belong to the monasteries. Second option was raising trade duties that they could not do under the 1914 trade agreement. The third one was assistance, which had been promised, which never became anything tangible. Now, why would Brit Tibet sign it? As you can imagine, because they were in weak position. So a lot of answers is because they had to do everything. So they had to please the British. They had to also not offend the Chinese. They had to militarize, but also pretend that they're very pre peaceful. I mean, uh, they had to pretend doesn't mean negatively, right? I mean, they had to follow policies that show that they didn't want war. Because Tibet was a weak power vis-a-vis -vis everyone. So they had very little option. But it's very clear that even when they sought independence, the British prevented them from doing so. And one reason was because, and again, there are 
statement from all British officials saying that a sterilized policy of Tibet, a sterilized Tibet is more suitable for our interest. Because an open Tibet would imply Russians and Japanese also coming in. So it's best for us to keep Tibet backward, and these are statements, best to keep Tibet backward to suit our interest and their mentality. So it fits into a very exoticized notion of Tibetans being very backward and they're wanting to be backward, when Tibetans actually didn't want to be backward and British wanted them to be backward. Now, where do we come in forward? What you know is, of course, in on ground, even British officials from 1915 were not sure of the legality of it, by the way. They didn't know and they, it was, they were divided. 1930s onward, it changed on paper, but the policy that was followed was, let's change map quietly without you know, much fanfare. Let's change situation on ground quietly. Diplomatically, they tried to raise the Tibetans, but they feared that Tibetans will actually denounce entire Shimla Convention. So they didn't want to do that. So their, our policy was, let us change reality on the ground. Let Tibetans protest to us. And then when they protest, we'll claim, well, this is our territory. Now, this was the British policy until 1947. Let's move on, because I don't, how many minutes do I have? You have um, six. Oh, good. Then I want to come back to, come to India. And now, right, so in a sense, the Shimla Agreement or Shimla Convention Agreement and everything was recuperated in late 1930s and 1940s, implemented by end of 1951, while China was occupying Tibet. India was occupying Tawang, and therefore the Shimla Agreement in a certain sense became true only once Tibet was almost lost there. So very again ironic or disturbing that India benefits from the Shimla Agreement around the same time as the party that signed the Shimla Agreement lost its independence to China. Now, <coughs> Indian policy from 1940s onwards, and this is where my in I'm working on more now is, Look, British was occupy, consolidate control, reject protest as surprising and unjustified. And that's what Indians also did later. From Tibet, we are talking small territories of it. And of course, where were Tibetans in position to question India a lot? No, they weren't. Now, what has happened in 1950s, and I shall jump into that because I have only five minutes left possibly, is that one aspect, let's change reality on ground to suit our interest, our, our national interest. Let's profess friendship, but not any, not invest anything in the friendship unless it suits our interest, has been the policy since 1950s also. So only times Tibetans have been offered help is when India had no option or India thought that it would benefit from it in around 1962 and after 62. But apart from that, it's very clear that Indian policy in general, I'm not saying all Indians and or entire policy, but in general Indian policy has been to talk of friendship, historical uh, everything, but in concrete terms, almost do nothing. So in last 10 years, when we look at uh, where, you know, let's say last 10 years, Tibetans have self-immolated. How many statements have been made by Indian government expressing anything about it? None. Tibetans have been protesting again and again. How many statements have been made by India saying, well, it is about diversity of your people, please protect them and everything? None. Now, what does it say to us about India and its policy in Tibet? It says this, that essentially, India, I mean, Indian government has largely tried to quarantine the Tibet issue. These are rare instances, you know, I mean, most of, I mean, even I, I think we all know each other, or at least half of us know each other by face now, is, Similar people have interest in Tibet and talk about it. But there has been almost not an attempt. I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy, though I read a conspiracy into many things. No, I, but in a certain sense, there has been no investment by Indian state in expanding knowledge about Tibet and sympathy for Tibet in the wider population. And that for me is not coincidental. That is partly to enable Indian state to control Tibet issue the way it wants to. Now, I know, and I've said this, and a couple of you have disagreed in the past, but I mean, I'm not that confident that in future, there might be no grand agreement between India and China that completely gives up the whole notion of Tibet and Tibetan dignity in favor of the status quo on the boundary. I'm, 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 that's my reading. Now, to conclude, therefore, what I would like to argue is that 
So in Indian policy, and this is the way they, in that, that sense, India has followed Britain very much. Friendship, but no commitment. Interest, no values. Border is the main focus, not Tibet or Tibetans for that matter. Even when Tibet is focused, not real Tibetans, not living, breathing Tibetans. There's a divided view within the government. So there is no coherent Indian policy, to be honest. MEA, well, we might think MEA should control the policy. But a lot of time, MEA's relatively benign policy towards Tibetans might be subverted by other departments in the government. And that happens in many big states. And the strategic hypocrisy, and this is the term I use for the British policy, strategic hypocrisy of Britain, acknowledging Tibetan autonomy but recognizing Chinese suzerainty, even when Chinese are not suzerain, right? That strategic hypocrisy has been replaced by what I would call moral hypocrisy of India, which is profess friendship, almost lull Tibetans into believing that, look, you have to be grateful to us all the time, which Tibetans are, right? But this whole notion is that the Tibetans have to constantly thank India again and again and again in return for no concrete help to Tibetans in terms of getting the country back or genuine autonomy. Yes, India has offered a lot of help, I'm sure, in preserving the Tibetan culture in exile, but not in terms of the bigger political question. And remember, Tibet is not about how great, you know, how popular Tibetan culture is across the world. To be honest, that is not the core issue. Core issue is not even the Dalai Lama, not even those Tibetans who live in India or exile. Core issue is the fate of Tibetans who live under occupation. And Indian policy has done nothing to help those under occupation until now. So what at least we would expect is, and with that I'd end is, what we need in India, and this is where I think our role or your role would is more honesty and a true decolonization of policy. Thank you. Thank you, Divyesh. I can't wait for the question and answer session. Um, I um, will now, uh, and thank you for observing the time um, constraints. Um, <clears throat> I now ask uh, Mr. Tenzing Norge to please uh, read his paper, which is on Tibet in the Great Game, The View from London. Uh, so I think like uh, I'm the only one who's going to use the projector properly. Uh, yeah, so my topic is Tibet in the Great Game, uh, the view from London. I think like uh, I'm going to cover a lot about the historical relationship and how it has evolved in the Great Game, and uh, and uh, the results are what uh, you know we have today. We are living the history. I think like you know uh, this particular. Uh, conference is about um, to mark the centennial of the Simla Convention, but I think be long before that, long before the British uh, discovered the strategic importance of uh, Tibet, uh, Tibet has always been at the junction of competing empires. You know, uh, it has been like a prized position in the competing empires of uh, Mongols and the Chinese Empire. Uh, and what we know now as you know, priest-patron relationship uh, has evolved from this Central Asian uh, imperial board game. Um, so, you know, first of all, I think we should also look into the Chinese mindset. China, for over, mil over millennia, you know, they have always had been thinking about the tribal impeachments, impeachments from the West. Uh, from the West meaning the central uh, steps. And over these centuries, they've always thought and rethought and developed strategies on how to uh, you know, confront or rather how to tackle the tribal impeachments from the Central Asian steps. When the Mongols and the Tibetans entered into a priest patron relationship, uh, the Chinese also joined it later. Uh, not because uh, the Chinese were interested in Buddhism, but they saw that by control, by getting into this relationship and by controlling the Tibetan lamas, they will be in turn be able to control the nomadic tribes from the West who had been always menacing uh, their territory. So that is like 
what their, their thinking has always been in terms of like the three concentric circles. <coughs> That's why China is called Tungo, Middle Kingdom. Because China is the center, and all the others are, uh, in the peripheries are barbarians, and, uh, and the barbarians vary from one center to, from one circle to the other. Uh, now let me get to the 1914 scene. This is what 1914 looks like. Right? It's literally covered with colonial empires. Uh, the whole green portion is the result of the Russian Empire. And uh, then you have, in peach color, the British Empire throughout the world. Uh, <clears throat> again, this was what was, uh, you know, like uh, above uh, British Raj at that time. And their fear was if they're going to expand further, they're going to get in direct contact with the British Empire. And once you get into direct contact, inevitably some sort of a conflict, armed conflict erupts. So the British, in a way, uh, policy was, you know, if you look at this slide, you can literally see there's like a limit to the empires, and the British knew that that you know the uh, that the uh, limits of the empire has already been reached, and if it is not tackled properly, armed conflict is inevitable. And if you look into what one of the most controversial and provocative geopolitical thinker of the time, Sir Halford Mackinder in his very, very provocative uh, article, uh, The Geopolitical History uh, you know, uh, of the World. This was what Mackinder uh, said in 1904, that the Central Asian Eurasian portion will <coughs> form the pivot area, and whoever controls it will control the world. Because once, uh, you know, in that sense, it was Russia, and uh, the Russian Empire, if it uh, expands further, then it gets into the inner or the marginal crescent, and then they get the access to the seas, and then, uh, in a way, you have access to the whole world and you can control it. So it was kind of a mechanical theory, uh, which has been trashed and retrashed in uh, the late, uh, dec later decades, but now, uh, it is re-emerging. This whole theory is re-emerging with uh, the rise of China. But whatever, uh, Mackinder's theory was like in a way never considered seriously at 1904. It was only after the First World War that his theory was uh, taken into quite a serious consideration. But I would say long before even Mackinder, George Nathaniel Curzon, the Viceroy and Governor General of India, was even uh, sharper in that sense. You know, he wrote in 1901 that as a student of the uh, Russian aspiration, ambitions, uh, you know, uh, and observing the Russian moves for 15 years, his conclusion was that the Russia's ambition was the dominion of Asia. So that's why he was very worried about the uh, Russians and uh, also wanted to ensure that uh, the two empires come into some sort of uh, agreement and avoid armed conflict. So when the uh, 1914 similar uh, convention took place, uh, the goal of the Imperial Britain was to check the expansion of the Russian Empire and the objectives were to create a buffer zone between British, uh, uh, Russia and British India through diplomatic negotiations and uh, to bring Tibet uh, under the British sphere of influence and secure the Sino-Tibet frontier. Uh, again, we are talking on this underlined uh, text over there, which is a convention between Great Britain, China, and Tibet at Simla. But before that, there were uh, historical documents between Tibet and China, and they were after uh, this particular convention. Uh, as uh, the political leader mentioned in his speech this morning, in Sino-Tibet Treaty of 821 and 1922, uh, all to the east is the great country of China, and all to the west is the country of Great 
uh, Tibet. But, you know, throughout these centuries, the relationships have evolved. And if you look into the, uh, all the other conventions, there have been always been some uh, conventions between uh, uh, over Tibet, but not necessarily with participation from Tibet. Uh, so the immediate convention before uh, the 1914 similar convention was the convention between Great Britain and Tibet, 1904, which was, uh, you know, uh, after uh, Francis' young husband's military expedition to Tibet. This expedition literally changed the whole scene. The 1904 Lhasa Convention in Article 9, if you look, and I'm afraid like, uh, but you know, you can remember it, Article 9 is the key. Uh, you know, it, it literally establishes Tibet as a uh, protectorate of the British Empire, all right? Uh, so, you know, uh, when, so why did Francis Young, why did Curzon send Young Husband on this military expedition? You know, before that, I think again, like the 1890 convention over British uh, uh, India and China over Sikkim was, uh, you know, agreed. And through that agreement, uh, Sikkim was in a way uh, brought under the British uh, territory. And uh, the Tibetans were not really happy uh, in that sense because uh, they removed the territorial markers and there were some uh, small-scale hostilities going on. So, you know, when, uh, the, uh, when George Nathaniel Curzon tried to establish some sort of a relation or diplomatic communication with the 13th Dalai Lama, uh, the communications were never returned. Uh, so he was quite frustrated and he had to send that military expedition. And when the, uh, you know, so this is what um, Curzon had to say in his speech in, 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 uh, in England, because there was a lot of public criticism over his policy. And that, you know, he was saying like, ever since they and we, and not we assumed the aggressive and first invaded British territory 18 years ago, meaning Sikkim, the Sikkim boundary. So, you know, uh, this was what his argument was to uh, the British public. And, you know, again, like, uh, uh, his argument was to create Tibet as a buffer state. And uh, again, uh, that was a huge concept at that time, to create buffer states wherever the empires were coming into contact. And uh, this was the definition that he provided. That as under co commonly understood, i.e., the country possessing a national existence of its own, which is fortified by the territorial and political guarantee, <laughs> either of the two powers between whose dominion it lies and by whom, it would otherwise inevitably be crushed for a number of great powers interested in the preservation of status quo. And he never had any intention of making it a British, uh, Tibet, you know, making Tibet a British dependency. Because when you do the cost-benefit analysis, it was not in the benefit. The benefit was lower than the cost. So now we are into this actual sim similar convention. Uh, you know, so the similar convention is actually broken into f eight formal uh, sessions. But I think like b before that, one thing to remember is after uh, Young Husband's expedition and the subsequent uh, you know, uh, re-agreement between uh, the British India and China, which is the 1906, which literally canceled the protectorate status of Tibet. Uh, there were a lot of armed conflict going on between the Tibetans and the Chinese in the Eastern Tibet sector. So, uh, you know, uh, when, you know, British interests at that time were tied up in two. On the one hand, they have their frontier problem with vis-a-vis uh, -vis Tibet. And on the other hand, they have uh, other uh, larger commercial interests in mainland China. And they, their whole policy was to, you know, you, you have to neutralize these two competing imperatives. Uh, and uh, their policy was to uh, recognize uh, uh, 
uh, or in a way encourage Tibetan autonomy and also to limit the Chinese power in Tibet. So that's, that's what the plan was. So on the eve of a uh, uh, similar convention, the British and the Tibetans saw an opportunity to build uh, agreement on the political, uh, uh, you know, in a political turmoil in China. Uh, but the Chinese were not ready to come to this conference. So what happened was, the, in order to bring uh, the new Republican government uh, headed by President Yuan Shikai, the British uh, used uh, you know, the carrot of recognition of his government if he comes to this conference. Otherwise, they will not be able to uh, recognize uh, Yuan Shikai's government. So that's how the Chinese uh, cent central government, who have always never considered Tibetans to be an equal uh, partner or never to have an equal role, got an equal role in this conference. Uh, so on the morrow of this convention, uh, all the te 10 great powers uh, involved in China recognized Yuan Shikai's government. And uh, immediately after that, the similar convention took place on 13th October. Uh, again, uh, Yuan Shikai's government also recognized uh, Tibet's autonomy uh, on 7 October. So you have seen the balance over here. So the 13 October and the 18 November similar conference uh, sessions literally was about the limits of Tibet. What was Tibet? This was in contention. Uh, on the uh, upper left is what the frontier of Tibet as claimed by the Tibetans in 1914. And uh, just below that, is the frontier of Tibet as claimed by nationalist Chinese. And, uh, <coughs> and on the right, on the lower part, is the actual territories under the control of the Dalai Lama's government. And on the top is the frontier of Tibet proposed at the Tripartite Similar Conference. So I think like, you know, again, this whole Eastern Tibet has been a lot of interest. And uh, this is what Alistair Lamb has to say in his definitive book, Tibet, China, and India, 1940-1950. Eastern Tibet was subject to a number of influences from the 16th cent century at least. It was a frontier track between several power foci, the Chinese in Yunnan, Sichuan, and Sinning on the one hand, and Lhasa on the other. And different places possessed different loyalties and attitudes. Over a thousand years, the Chinese expanded their empire by cultural as well as political or military imperialism. The Tibetans were among the very few border peoples of the Middle Kingdom who could, given a chance, score cultural victories over the Chinese. So when the similar conference was taking place, as you know, after uh, uh, the Qing, uh, you know, when after Yang Haspen's uh, military expedition arrived, the imperial government at that time, before its collapse, in its last year, formulated a new policy to bring uh, Tibet under the direct control. Although, like uh, you know, uh, this relationship has always been there, and there's a lot of complexities and controversies over there, but it was Tibet was never under the direct control of uh, the center, and there was never an assimil assimilationist policy as such. But when after Yang Haspen's military expedition, the policy of the imperial government changed and they launched an integrationist policy. And that's how the imperial com uh, commissioner Tao Arfang, or before that, Chiang Yintang, they were all sent to bring Tibet under direct control. Uh, Tao Arfang's policy was brutal, rude, and he was, in a way, through his excessive, um, you know, like uh, troops and military power, he was able to crush the Tibetans in the Eastern Tibet. And within, literally within uh, three or four years, he was able to bring the whole of Tibet, Eastern Tibet, under his control. And then in 1909 <coughs> and 1910, he proceeded towards Lhasa to bring it under the control. And that's how the 13th Dalai Lama again fled 
uh, you know, into exile. So at this uh, conference, uh, when this conference was taking place, Eastern Tibet was under the control uh, of the Imperial Commissioner. So that's why, you know, when you have these all different arguments from Lun Chen Shata and, Lun, uh, and Ivan Chen, uh, Lun Chen Shata, despite he brought, like, you know, despite he brought bundles and bundles of uh, receipts of tax and, you know, uh, titles on those territorial uh, over the centuries, but um, Ivan Chen made this argument of this territory being under China, Imperial China's control on the international law of effective occupation. So for Henry McMahon, he was like in a way uh, lost at what to do, and uh, he came out with this idea of inner and outer Tibet on the model, Russian model of inner and outer Mongolia, you know. So because this was under the, con uh, because uh, politics is always about control. And in this Eastern Tibet, the control was already under Tower Fung's, you know, troops. So his plan was to, uh, you know, uh, finally put forward this proposition of inner and outer Tibet. And uh, that's how, uh, the whole inner and outer Tibet concept came into existence. But then, I, I was now only one minute, I will switch. Uh, when, you know, when uh, Ivan Chen initially on 27 April initialed the document, just two, day late, two days later, uh, the Foreign Ministry of China repudiated his uh, initials. And uh, so after 27 April to 3rd July, there were a lot of negotiations taking place, and uh, this was the note that was appended to the uh, document. Uh, and this note, in a way, it's interesting. In the first point, it says, like, it is understood by the high contracting parties that Tibet forms part of Chinese territory. And again, the other uh, balancing um, point was, outer Tibet shall not be represented in the Chinese parliament or in any other similar body. Uh, but unfortunately, this didn't, okay, here's my timer. Uh, this, <laughs> this actually didn't really work out, and uh, somehow there were a lot of efforts to bring into some sort of a consensus, uh, and uh, it never really worked out. And uh, uh, because my alarm has sounded, so I will say the closest this agreement could have come into, you know, uh, into some sort of a conclusion was in uh, 1919, when uh, the Chinese foreign ministry proposed to, you know, re, uh, doc um, reformulate the uh, actual document by uh, importing some of the points in the uh, uh, appended note into the actual, uh, you know, uh, convention document. But then, as enigmatic as they act, uh, always had been, as they proposed, they also withdrew it. So, you know, so uh, it again broke down. So after that, the rest is history. That a lot of speakers have spoken. Uh, since this morning, and this, this was whole uh, a very secret conference, and uh, the, con con the convention document was also kept very secret until 1938, uh, when it was revealed in the Atchison treaties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now uh, call on uh, Mr. Naresh Mathur on reconciliation of perspectives and its outcome. Uh, Mr. Mathur is an advocate, so I look forward to hearing from you, and I want to speak. Thank you. Oh, yes, if that's all right. Absolutely. Yes. Well, there is this, if one could say that if one's foresight were to resemble a hindsight a little more, we'd be in a lot less trouble. Uh, you know, there is a school of thought that whatever happened in Tibet, including the young husband expedition, uh, China had closed off four of its five ports and was only accessible through Shanghai. And all that British India wanted to do was to trade, was to also find ways to enter China through Tibet. They sent many letters. The Tibetans returned them unopened. Uh, this was one factor. 
And the other was that the Dorjeev from Buryat, I think, where, where he was from, this monk, who was very, very, uh, who was studying a very learned scholar in Tibet, a very close friend of the 13th the Dalai Lama, and apparently, as it now appears, of the Tsar, of Tsar Nicholas. Uh, the Russians, the, the, the British always feared that because of his proximity to the Tsar and to the, uh, and to the Dalai Lama, um, he would create some intrigue whereby, uh, uh, whereby the, the, the Russians, while heading to the warm waters, would invade Tibet. Now, um, a myth had to be created, as we, as we know, that in 1904, uh, after young husband invades uh, 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 Tibet, at the end of it, what do they do? They take a quick account and they say, well, it cost us 75,000 pounds. So you will pay us, you Tibet will pay us 1,000 pounds for 75 years. And till then, we will occupy Chumbi Valley till you don't pay us the 75,000 pounds. So um, uh, now, obviously, uh, London was, uh, was, uh, was upset with this. And London said, no, this cannot be done. So this was, uh, you know, this, the, the penalty was reduced, etc. I don't want to get into that. But uh, in fact, uh, because they feared this advance, they wanted to create a myth of Chinese suzerainty over Tibet. Why? Because they did not want to defend Tibet against a possible Chinese advance. So this is wha how the great game, one, uh, wha one theory of how this great game was being played out. So in fact, there was no suzerainty. And suzerainty was an idea embedded in the mind of young husband. Young husband was coming back from the Boers War. And after a long time, you know, this term suzerainty was even extant at that time, but it had been used somehow in, in the Boers War. So he had it in his mind, and it was used uh, in the 1904 agreement. But be that as it may, you know, now, so had Tibet known this, that all they wanted was, uh, was access, they could have, like the Swiss, become policemen and guided the British through Tibet into, into China, uh, you know. But you see these European rivalries in this period of colonization, they created a lot of trouble here. They created a lot of trouble. But now, coming closer to home, I uh, want to in take this opportunity to introspect and ask myself the question. You know, we've been, we've been hearing about Shimla all day. Uh, and we know that large territories were ceded by my, 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 the previous speakers have dealt with this issue, uh, that large territories were ceded because Tibet thought it was trading uh, territory for recognition as a de jure independent autonomous state. That didn't happen. Um, but because Tibet felt that it could do this trade, uh, the Shimla agreement, this large territory which was ceded, now much of what we have, the Himalayan India, comes from Shimla. <coughs> now, can we retain these territories without one, de jure recognizing Tibet as an independent state? Two, without recognizing the validity of Shimla Convention of 1914. Can we retain the benefit of a treaty without recognizing it, its validity, and the independent status and the treaty-making capacity of the parties? The answer in law is you cannot, is you cannot. Now. Uh, since we have <coughs> so much spoken of Shimla and our policy is the direct antithesis of what Shimla's final conclusion was, 
Let me read to you the Anglo-Tibetan Declaration of 3rd July 1914, precisely a hundred years. We, the plenipotentiaries of Great Britain, Tibet, hereby record the following declaration to the effect that we, are, that we acknowledge the annexed convention as initialed to be binding on the governments of Great Britain and Tibet. And now, this is important, and we agree that so long as the government of China withholds signature to the aforesaid convention, she will be debarred from enjoyment of all privileges accruing therefrom. So the critical sentence is here is that as long as the government of China withholds signature to the aforesaid convention, she will be debarred from the enjoyment of all privileges accruing therefrom. Now, what were the critical privileges which accrued to China? One was, as, as, uh, as has been said earlier in this very session itself, uh, carving up of Tibet into inner and outer, direct control to China was offered in the first round of negotiation. And as somebody has rightly said, this, this, this convention was in three parts. Started in Shimla in the summer of 13, when it became cold, moved to Delhi. The McMahon line was actually drawn up and signed in Delhi. And then uh, it moved on, and the, the, the concluding, st uh, concluding stages were back in Shimla. So, <clears throat> in uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. So in, in the, uh, uh, the, after the McMahon line is drawn in Delhi and they go back, uh, and they go back to Shimla, uh, a few things happen. One of them is that, <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, one of them that is, is that in, is that in sh I I I as, an, as an outcome of this, the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I need to come back to my note. I have strayed a little bit, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for a moment. Yes. <clears throat> so, as the as the territories now which we have, which have been, uh, you know, uh, which have become a part of McMahon line, now can we retain these territories? The answer clearly is no. For that, the first thing that we need to do is to recognize that Tibet is de jure an independent state. And the second thing we need to recognize is that Tibet had the treaty making capacity and power. Now, because there was no ceding of the outer Tibet and no Chinese suzerainty over inner Tibet, the position is that Tibet is actually sovereign and independent. And because it is sovereign and independent, uh, this impacts in turn upon the status of Tibet as it emerges or as it has to be considered in the 1951-17 point agreement. You know the 1951-17 point agreement talks about Tibet's return to the motherland. Now this would be valid if under if at the conclusion of Shimla Tibet was not an independent state but if Tibet was an independent state then where is the question of any return to the motherland? Now, you take Shimla and the 17 point, the, at the conclusion of Shimla, it is very clear that Tibet emerges as an independent sovereign state. Because if none of these, uh, if none of these uh, privileges, which were meant to be uh, uh, conferred upon the Chinese, uh, were conferred, in fact, Tibet emerges 
as, as fully autonomous, and perhaps not even, uh, I would not even use the term autonomous, I would say as a sovereign state. Now, this is the truth. This is the truth of Tibet. And as a matter of fact, Britain adhered to this till 1900, till, sorry, till 2008, for 94 years post Shimla, from 1914 to 2008, Brit uh, which is when Britain formally reneged uh, from this position. So in fact, the fact that they reneged 94, year, 94 years later only attests and affirms the fact that Britain too, though they, they diddled, they obfuscated uh, the status of Tibet at different stages, and I think uh, earlier speakers have alluded to that, Britain, uh, Tibet nevertheless had that status. Now, what did, how did we conduct ourselves? Did we recognize this one very simple paragraph? How, on what basis has India looked at Tibet? Arguably, we are the only country in the world which have had the closest relationship with Tibet. We have had, the Tibetans have been coming here from the 8th century. The Tibetans have been coming to our monasteries for, you know, for 500 years. They've been translating the Sanskrit scriptures into Tibetan, the, these two great translation periods. There has been no authentic and as extensive a transmission of a civilization to the other than from India to Tibet. Some mention and cite the transmission from Greece to Rome. But if you actually look at the transmission, civilizational transmission, the civilizational transmission from India to Tibet is far more extensive, far more authentic, and, and, and uh, you know, all encompassing. So can we claim that we do not know the status of Tibet? Can we, can we, can we, uh, can we even dare to say this to ourselves? Excellency has said, Tibet has behaved in an autonomous way and was cut off from other countries. The criteria of an independent state is that the state should have independent foreign relations and Tibet had no foreign relations except with England. Now, this is a remarkable statement, you know, uh, for the reason that, that the first thing it says is that Tibet had suzerainty. Now, this suzerainty, as we've seen, post Shimla, is unfounded. Uh, now, what is pre-Shimla is this period from 1248 to 1911. This period from 1248 to 1911 is divided into three periods, actually. First was the relationship between the Sakya Pandit, Sakya Pandita, and, the, uh, and Kublai Khan. Starts with that, in which uh, a, a remarkable thing happens that in 1248, uh, 1248, uh, Kublai Khan invades Tibet, conquers it militarily, and 1258 conquers, uh, conquers China. Uh, thereafter, one of, his, uh, one of his wives is a Buddhist, and the Buddhist wife of Kublai requests uh, the Sakya Pandita for an initiation, for a Buddhist initiation, which he decides to give her. And in this initiation, uh, in the first part of the initiation, at the end of it, Kublai is so, so overcome and overawed by Sakya Pandita that he hands back six of the 13 prefectures. At the end of the second round of initiations, he hands back the entire Tibet. So Sakya Pandita has actually con converted a military defeat uh, into, uh, in, into, this, into, this, uh, into the situation where back he's received back, he is then appointed uh, he is appointed the imperial preceptor of all of Kublai Khan's empire. Buddhism becomes the state religion, and he is become. He then is the military. He's the he's the ruler of all of Tibet. Now this relationship in 1350s, around 1350s, 1360s, is then uh, is been trans transferred to the relationship between the Karmapas and the Ming dynasty. Now the Karmapas become, and Indians are very well situated to understand this relationship because the Tibetan Lamas 
first Sakya Pandita, then the Karmapas, and thereafter the Dalai Lamas, they become the Rajgurus of these emperors, first Mongolian, then Ming, and then Manchu. They become the Rajgurus of these emperors who are emperors of lands which include China. It's very interesting, let's bear this in mind, that out of the, from the 13th to the 20th century, in this period of 700 years, China is ruled by Ming dynasty, which is a Chinese dynasty, only for 300 years. All the other times, they have been ruled by foreign, by, by invaders, by kings, by, by, you know, just as the Indians were ruled by the Mughals at one time. Uh, so, out of these 700 years, for 400 years, they've been ruled by Mongolians and then by the Manchus. Now, this relationship of, of a Rajguru and the, uh, and, the, and the Guru being also an emperor and the disciple also being an emperor was what was called Choyon. It is an abbreviation of Chone Yondak or a priest and a patron, which was the definition of this relationship between these two individuals, which was transposed even at the level of state. And the fact that the most important of the Manchu emperors felt this obligation and adhered to this obligation can be seen from the two Gurkha wars in 1788 and 1791, when the Gurkhas invaded Tibet and on both occasions, Chen Lung sent his troops to defend the Dalai Lama. So this relationship was taken very, very seriously. Now, with, do we not understand this relationship? Why are we only going by a Eurocentric international law which cannot, comp you know, which cannot comprehend relationships other than sovereignty and suzerainty? Our Asian relationships are far more complex and who was better suited to understand the complexity of this relationship than India. And so th this, this, this statement of Pandit Nehru that we have always recognized Chinese suzerainty over Tibet in direct contradiction to Shimla and in direct understanding of what the Chone Yondak relationship may have been. Uh, do I still have a few minutes? Uh, three. Okay. Now, Now, what can tangibly be done? You know, when this, when Al Salvador raised the dispute before the United Nations General Assembly, uh, Panditji scotched any discussion at the General Assembly. He sent written instructions to our representative at the UN that do not cause any discussion to be held and restrain, abstain from voting. Uh, Tibet was done in by Doug Hamayold, the Secretary General of the United Nations. He did not permit Tibet to place any evidence before the General Assembly of their, in support of their position that they were an independent state. So do we owe anything to Tibet, having scotched this discussion? Well, perhaps we do. Uh, and what we, we definitely, you know, uh, what we definitely need to do to make reparation to some degree uh, morally or ethically is that you know this government need not feel itself hemmed in uh, by the by the past by, by this past heritage which is a complete and an uh, you know complete denial or or an incorrect reading of what was the real status of tibet uh, so perhaps this government can, you know, be, nobody suggesting has been said earlier that there be, you know, that, that there be any, anything other than friendship with China, but let us base it on something honest, on something real. Let us base it upon, an, upon a, a true understanding of Tibet because now they have shown us up another map and Ladakh and Arunachal is a part of, uh, you know, is a part of, uh, of, of Tibet and hence of China. Till we do not say the Simla word, till we do not <laughs> advert to Simla, 
uh, we have no other plausible defense or explanation uh, for, for claiming Arunachal Pradesh and other parts which can come to us by way of Simla. We have no other explanation, no other plausible explanation uh, for claiming these as part of India. And we always fight shy, we always fight shy of adverting to Shimla for some reason we have been always traumatized uh, uh, by the Chinese, for, you know, first because of this Nehruvian understanding, secondly because of the 1962 war, and now by the mega growth of China. So for some reason, we are never able to face China squarely in its eye uh, and tell them that, look, this is how we understand our history in which we've been very important players. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've come to recognize that all the disputes that plague us in the world today uh, seem to have three dimensions to them, uh, an historical dimension, a legal dimension, and a political dimension. Um, and in the three presentations today, we saw all three, uh, and we heard from all three. So interesting. I will open it up to questions. Uh, with questions. Yes. Please. I'm Namrita. I'm from IDSA. I'm a research fellow. So my question is to Professor Anand. So in your presentation, there was one. It's a question, so I, but I'll just take a half a minute. So uh, in your presentation, you made this statement that uh, Arunachal, uh, NEFA mostly, were Tibetan territory, right? So in my research on NEFA or Arunachal Pradesh now, what came out from the local perspectives is that districts like Dapariju, Lower Siang, uh, Tirap Changlang, which has the Tangsa Nagas, and then you have the Adis in uh, Lower Siang, they do not see themselves as Tibetan or connected to the notion of Tibetan territory. So in your research, are you able to delineate with what exactly was Tibetan territory? Because again, when I went to Tawang area and the Manchuka area, that's of course connected to Tibet very deeply. So when we make statements like the whole NEFA or part of NEFA, I, th I think it's important to clarify. But I would like to hear your views on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, oh, oh. I think, oh. go ahead. Very quickly, in fact, uh, yeah, let me clarify. In fact, uh, should be mo the, it was the Tawang tract I was specifically talking about. Now, the other areas, right, they haven't have different elements of Tibetanization, but they've also resisted it. So they've always been between the As Assam and Tibet, but without ever being part of one or the other. So it was largely the Tawang area I was talking about, but, but at the same time, but they were also not Indian, so there was no Indianization as such. Yes. So in a sense, it's a very complicated history of zones of conflict and zones of contact, but they were neither Chinese nor Indian as such, and therefore the claims are always in some sense continued. But the area I was talking about and about direct Tibet control was Tawang Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Pradeep. I'm from IDSA. I've got one question on Primaku and Chendru. When I went to Along, and then I read uh, Malik's book, the people of Primaku and Chendru, that is across the line of control where the U-Bend takes place, had petitioned to join India. So what is the background? Because you probably have got access to that. They had petitioned to join India. Primaku and Chendru, that no, is I north don't. of Jiling and Along. No, I didn't have access to that. No, so what is the, I mean, <coughs> from the panel, because Did you know they India? had petitioned to join yeah. India. Second is in the work of Tony Huber. Tony Huber has proved that the Tibetans actually had brutal control on various parts of Arunachal. Hmm. Uh, later on, uh, uh, Captain Lightfoot in 1930s of the British, he went according to Mehra's book and then did some survey there. And then Bob Khating in 1951 hmm. planted the flag in Tawang. So this is actually the historical truth. So therefore, if they t what sort of tribute were they taking? Was it uh, a tribute which means territorial uh, thing, or it was a, a tribute? Because then, because the boundaries, how do you decide? How are you so confident that this is our sovereign a part of India? That argument, we need more support. Hmm. So um, this is a, Thank you. Okay. a vague question, but. Uh, <laughs> Would you like to no, no, answer it? Well, um? and very quickly. In terms of the petition part, I mean, look, ideally, if Tibetans are given an option today, most of them may join India rather than China, right? I mean, 
and there have been efforts, specifically in the 1950s, where people across the border did try to appeal that they would join India, but of course no one would accept that. Now, in terms of uh, Arunachal, the, even the even the uh, Tawang area, so Tibet, as everyone has pointed out, was never a territory territory in the modern sense. Neither was India or nor most places. And Tibetans were also an imperial people themselves. So they were not only the weak powers stuck between big powers, but from perspective of Monpas, for instance, Tibetans are seen as almost ruthless rulers and also very arrogant rulers. So there have been different kinds of control in the region. And in fact, for instance, Tony, who you brought him, he himself talks of the colonization by India of the region also. So there has been colonization of various, colonization by Tibetans, then colonization by the Chinese, and colonization by the Indians. So in that sense, we see an area where different kinds of colonial model have been taking place. But the problem so far has been that in most cases, the people themselves are not paid enough attention to. And final point, 1930s and 40s, a lot of, and by the way, British officials would say, oh, Monpas are the oppressed people and Tibetans are the ruthless ones. But it was a conscious effort to say it in order to then justify taking the territory de facto away. So I have come across in my work, I'm doing that, looking at officials saying, look, Monpas and Tibetans can get along, okay. And others are saying, no, 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 Monpas are the oppressed people and we, the civilized British, have to liberate Monpas from the Tibetans.